Okay, hey, we're going to get started. Uh, hello and welcome to the 35th Virtual History of 2021. Nathan Denny is Associate Director of the Baltimore Architecture Foundation. Uh, first, thank you to everyone who donated to be with us today. Your support enables us to organize virtual history. Uh, the pre this presentation is also part of Doors Open Baltimore, uh, the citywide celebration of architecture neighborhoods with programs and tours throughout October. We've got um, uh, another week of Doors Open coming up. All of the, uh, the in-person tours on the weekends have sold out, but we do have uh, a few virtual programs. Um, uh, big, also a big thank you to the sponsors of Doors Open for uh, supporting us. Uh, and I hope you, you can join us on October 29th, uh, uh, next Friday for our next virtual history, A History of Poppleton with Nicole King. She'll be uh, discussing uh, the history of Poppleton and also the, the current preservation efforts underway in the neighborhood uh, to preserve this uh, historic African-American neighborhood and to fight displacement. And then, uh, these, sorry, these slides are a bit out of order. Uh, the, the day before that, October 28th, uh, we'll be uh, hosting a presentation about um, the best product showrooms, which are these um, really quirky postmodern um, style department stores. Uh, this is the one that was in Towson here, the Tilt Showroom. So that should be a lot of fun. Uh, but today, uh, I'm very, very happy to have Ward Buecher and uh, Lisa Johnson here to talk about the Holly Hustler House. And um, if you're an architecture nerd like me, you've probably uh, wondered what the deal is with this house, you know, what's going to happen to it. And uh, it couldn't be in better hands um, with Ward and, and Lisa having bought the house a few years ago and are currently um, working to renovate, which we'll hear about. Ward is an architect who loves fixing old buildings, both by design and hands-on construction. He wrote the Dictionary of Building Preservation and has over 50 years of experience as a historical architect. Lisa has been assisting Encore Sustainable Architects for over 20 years. Avid about history and a self-professed research wonk, Lisa is knowledgeable, experienced, and, and a skilled writer and researcher. She assists on course projects with identifying, uh, assessing, compiling, and coordinating historical research information and data, coordinating key information with on course team. And Lisa has held professional management positions with historical societies and foundations and is a member of historical and genealogical societies in Maryland and Virginia. Uh, so with that, Ward and Lisa, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn over to you. And also, if you have any questions during the presentation, please add them to the chat box or the Q&A box. With that, Ward and Lisa, take it away. Well, thank you. Uh, welcome to the Holly Hutzler House. Uh, we're going to be your tour guides uh, to take you through time and space. We're going to go back in a time machine uh, uh, led by uh, Lisa, and then I'm going to take you through the house to see uh, uh, a bit of what it was and uh, is and uh, what it's going to be. Well, welcome everyone, good afternoon. Over, for over 30 years, I have served as my family's historian and genealogist. So it has been with great interest for me to research the development of the Bolton Hill neighborhood and the creation of the Holly Hutzler house and the history of the people who have lived there. The baton pass of its stewardship through the generations was tracked by researching through documents, history books, photographs, newspaper articles, and, gene and family genealogies. So let's begin. The development of Utah Place. In the uh, period, you have to start sharing your screen. Share your screen. Aha, uh -huh. so this is 1801 Utah Place. There it is, thank you. And this is on the corner of Utah Place and Lawrence Street in Bolton Hill. In the period after the Civil War, many American cities competed with one another to develop conspicuous splendors and Baltimore was no exception. As one example, a rather ordinary residential street of no particular distinction, Gibson Street, was widened and landscaped in imitation of the city of Paris's famous Avenue 
the Champs Elysees. It was named Utah Place after the Battle of Utah Springs of the American Revolutionary War in South Carolina. In 1877, the commissioners of Baltimore announced the first award for extending Utah Place from Lawrence Street to North Avenue. By 1896, the Boulevard Street was a wonder of beauty with fountains and plantings that changed with the seasons. Enter Nicholas Popline. Nicholas Popline was a widely known businessman of Baltimore. Born in Prussia, he founded and was president of the Popline Silicated Phosphate Fertilizer Company. In 1849, he and his wife, Susanna Thompson Popline, built a beautiful three-story brick house at what at the time was beyond the termination of Utah Place for their growing family of 12 children. Mr. Popline also had extensive real estate interests within the city. In 1866 alone, Mr. Popline owned 20 properties. A fire in 1884 destroyed the dis extensive works of the Popline factory in Canton. Nicholas died the following year in 1885. Enter Thomas Campbell Kennedy, architect. Thomas C. Kennedy, AIA, was born in Ireland in 1848. His large body of mostly Romanesque style, residential, institutional, and church architecture design work is found throughout Baltimore, the state of Maryland, and the United States. He was from a distinguished family whose men were noted for their careers in military and governmental service in Britain. Between 1862 and 1872, Mr. Kennedy was apprenticed in architectural offices in London and Dublin, after which he immigrated to the United States. According to Half Century's Progress of the City of Baltimore, written in 1886, Mr. Kennedy is a native of Ireland, embarked in business on his own account here in 1876 as a senior partner in the firm of Kennedy and Dixon, the co-partnership continuing up to 1881 when Mr. Kennedy assumed sole control and has since conducted the business alone with uninterrupted success. A newspaper announcement in the Baltimore Sun, however, in, on October 2nd, 1880, states the partnership as Dixon and Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy's offices were located on Lexington Street and subsequently at 211 North Calvert Street. Thomas's wife, Kate Cecilia Kennedy, was also born in Ireland. Together they had four children, Florence, Henry, C. Austin, and Hugh. Kennedy became a member of the Baltimore chapter of the American Institute of Architects in 1899 and served as secretary of the Baltimore chapter. He was a member of the Knights of Columbus, the Catholic Benevolent Legion, the St. Vincent de Paul Conference, and other Catholic organizations. He was a parishioner of St. Cecilia's Roman Catholic Church of Walbrick, Baltimore. At the time of his untimely death, in 1914, at age 66, Kennedy was one of the best known architects in the city, known for his Romanesque designs. He died unexpectedly after being struck by an automobile while riding his bicycle. The Kennedys lived at Hansel Hall in Windsor Mills, 2106 Elsner Avenue, Baltimore. Mrs. Mrs. Kennedy died the following year in 1915. They are buried along with their three children, three of their four children in the new cathedral cemetery in Walbrook. Martin Hawley and Mary Webb Hawley. The year following Nicholas Popline's death in 1886, Martin Hawley purchased a vacant 50 foot by 130 foot vacant lot on the corner of Utah Place and Lawrence Street from Andrew Popline, one of Nicholas's sons and a trustee of his estate. Martin and Mary secured the design services of architect Thomas Kennedy and builder Benjamin F. Bennett to build the house, which was to become the Hawley Hutzler House. 
Martin Hawley was born in Binghamton, New York, the son of a prominent Presbyterian abolitionist and lumber merchant, Elias Hawley, and his wife, Adeline. Martin followed in his father's footsteps and became a wholesale lumber commission merchant in Baltimore. He went into business with nationally prominent businessman and relative R.K. Hawley, who was one of the foremost lumber operators in the country. Together with Joseph Strand, he ran the R.K. Hawley and Company. After R.K.'s death, Charles and Thomas Strand entered a partnership with Martin and the firm became known as Hawley and Strand. Martin was married to Mary Reynolds Webb of Wilmington, Delaware. The Hawley's more than 8,000 square foot house was a grand and commodious one for a family of three, including their daughter, Marion. In September, 1888, the Baltimore Sun reported the cost of the house to build was $70,000, which would be about $2 million in today's currency. In mid or near completion of the house, in July 1888, Martin Hawley died. Mary completed and lived in the house for nine years until her death in 1897. After her death to settle her, her estate, the house and all of its furnishings were auctioned. Baltimore native David Hutzler, president of the Hutzler Company, who with his wife, Ella Gutman Hutzler, lived at 1628 Utah Place, made the winning bid of $32,000 for the house in its entirety. And here you'll see the, the house in its earlier days with this uh, lovely uh, wooden fretwork at the top of the Belvedere. This is the Hawley's summer home that they had in Blue Ridge Summit, Pennsylvania. The, the train used to go up there where Baltimoreans used to go up for the summers and on weekends. After Martin Hawley's death, Mary Hawley commissioned the building of this church, also designed by Thomas Kennedy at the Memorial Chapel, the Hawley Memorial Chapel. And the um, Mr. and Mrs. Hawley are buried in the Greenmount Cemetery in Baltimore. Ah, okay, David Hutzler. David Hutzler was the son of Moses and Carolyn Neuberger Hutzler. His father was born in Hagenbach, Bavaria, and his mother was born in Perth, Bavaria. Following his father and older brother, Abram, at age 15, David entered into the dry goods business after his father and brother created the firm of M. Hutzler and Son. David and his wife, Ella, had five children, three boys and two daughters. Ella was the daughter of Joel and Bertha Gutman, Baltimore natives. Joel Gutman was the founder of the large retail dry goods and lace importing business, Joel Gutman and Company. It was located on North Utah Street. David Hutzler was a titan in the city of Baltimore known for his business and philanthropic activities. At the time of his death in 1915, at age 71. In addition to being president of the Hutzler Company, he was vice president of the Board of Trade, committee chairman of the National Board of Trade, a director of the Merchants, the Merchants and Manufacturers Association. Previously, he had held directorships in the, direct, in the Merchants Mechanics Bank, the Utah Savings Bank, and the Fidelity and Deposit Company. In 1915, the legendary Hutzler Brothers Department Store Company had already been in business for 57 years. It would continue to be in business for an additional 75 years, with a total of 10 department stores, all in Maryland, closing its doors in 1990 after 132 years. After David's death, Ella Hutzler continued to live in the house with family members for an additional 27 years until her death in 1942. With the onset of the war, great changes overtook the city, including the influx of newcomers from other states. During this time, many of the large houses 
in the city were divided to accommodate the numbers of workers supporting the war effort, including what was called hot bedding, where sleeping quarters were rented out according to work shifts. So I just want to interrupt for a second and point out that I was able to date this photograph because it had a 56 Chevy in the picture. Um, so we know it was taken sometime around uh, in the 1950s. Okay, thank you. So in 1942, the Holly Hutzler House was purchased by native Baltimorean Dr. Leon Joseph Steinberg and his wife, Mrs. Thelma Steinberg. During their tenure, the Steinbergs transformed the house plan where the family lived in the topmost part of it, the former billiards room on the third floor and the lower levels were divided into 10 professional medical office suites. After 26 years of residency and desiring to remove to Florida in 1968, the Steinbergs advertised the house to be sold at auction with the AJ Billing and Company. According to the title record, the sale did not proceed or was not successful. On December 21st, 1969, Dr. Steinberg died suddenly in Boca Raton, Florida. The following year in 1970, Mrs. Steinberg posted an attorney's sale for the house, again with the AJ Billing and Company auctioneers. This time the auction sale went through and the house was purchased for $15,000 by Dennis Capoza, a graduate student in economics at John Hopkins University who lived across the street. He was married in the rooftop Belvedere on the third floor. Four months after purchasing the house, Mr. Capoza secured the services of a realtor and the house was sold to the Boys Town Homes of Maryland. However, the Boys Town had initially opted for a property on Park Avenue, but after concerns and protests opposing it over concerns for increased petty crime, its zoning appeal was turned down, which you'll see there. None of you may remember the Boys Town of Maryland, an organization which, which helped at risk young boys aged eight to 12 to receive care and preventative care and treatment in a group home setting aimed at minimizing juvenile delinquency and recidivism. One of the interesting changes the Boys Town organization made during its tenure was not to the house, but within the 48 foot by 45 foot back walled garden. To accommodate the young active and growing boys, the entire garden was covered with asphalt to turn it into a basketball court. The Boys Town of Maryland owned the house for five years from 1971 until 1976. In January of 76, the house was sold to David and Ludmilla Burns. Unfortunately, we don't have a picture of them, but the Burns also owned the house directly across the street. They purchased the house with the idea of encouraging development of the neighborhood. Mr. and Mrs. Burns were friends of Michaeline and Richard, Michaeline McNeil and Richard Watson. Their children all went to school together and were in the boys' choirs. Michaeline and Richard fell in love with the house and the Burnses sold it to them the following year in 1977. Richard was an architect and an interior designer he was a graduate of Harvard College and the University of Pennsylvania's Department of Architecture. In 1977, he requested and was given approval to re reconfigure the house's floor plan into four dwelling units. The house retains this well thought out and tasteful floor plan to this day. With the assistance of Jack hammering the asphalt, Michaeline reclaimed the garden. Mr. Mr. Watson and Ms. McNeil separated, and Ms. McNeil retained the house and raised their two sons, Anthony and Alexander there. Ms. McNeil was a passionate preservationist for historic neighborhoods. She taught for over 25 years in the Baltimore City Schools, 
and worked tirelessly to improve the Bolton Hill neighborhood. She served on the Mount Royal and Utah Place Improvement Association and also led the neighborhood effort to build the Spicers Run community, which brought affordable owner-occupied homes into a lot that once held one of the most dangerous housing projects in the city. She restored two Victorian properties in Bolton Hill, including her home and managed rental units until her retirement in 2013. After 36 years and an onset of falling, failing health, Ms. McNeil moved from her beloved home in, 19, in, in 2013 to live with her son, Anthony, and his family. She died in 2016. After Michaeline's passing, the house was managed for a few years by her son, Anthony. In 2019, he put the home on the market. About that time, an old real estate colleague of Ward's called him one day and said, do I have a house for you? My husband has a penchant for falling in love with formerly grand or beautiful buildings, which are languishing. I love history, preservation, beautification and gardening. So we are a good match. With the Holly Hutzler house, he fell in, more in love with the house and I fell more in love with the garden and what they were and could be again. We hope to continue the house's strong legacy of stewardship until the time comes for us to pass the baton. Thank you. So this is the Lawrence Street elevation of the house and you can see uh, it uh, really is classic uh, uh, Kennedy style with the uh, uh, large planar field of, in this case, uh, pink granite uh, from Deer Island, Maine as on a, a gray granite uh, base, but with uh, projections uh, in the corners and bays and massive chimneys and eyebrow windows, everything that when you would first look at it, you'd say this was Richardsonian Romanesque. But as we discovered, um, Kennedy wasn't a doctor of the style uh, based on Richardson's success, but rather was an early uh, proponent and uh, really was his forte in uh, design. The uh, building itself has just a packed with wonderful uh, details, including these carvings, curvy linear um, dragons, geometric uh, shapes, uh, and in, interspersed among the rusticated uh, stones. The uh, ironwork is eclectic as many parts of the building are. You know, they're not, um, although, Overall, the architectural style is consistent. The details um, are not necessarily. So you can see on the right, this wonderful, um, perhaps East Lake style uh, railing, but a more traditional curvilinear railing in the basement windows. So this is near as we can reconstruct. This was the plan of the building uh, in 1887. Uh, the main entrance is on the upper left there. And um, you can see in each room, uh, if you can look carefully, uh, below the name of the room is the kind of wood. Every uh, uh, one of the public rooms had a different kind of wood on the first and second floor. Um, so some of them were common, oak and cherry, but others white mahogany um, and cypress and calico ash were uh, unusual. Um, and this, uh, what were pantries or in some cases are now uh, uh, kitchens. There was, we believe, a, uh, a summer kitchen on the first floor and the winter kitchen in the, in the basement. Um, we're not absolutely certain about that, but you can see um, it's, it's quite a, a well thought out circulation plan, although there's a huge amount of circulation space like the stair hall. So let's go inside. Welcome to our home. <laughs> um, so we have massive front doors. They're three inches thick. One of the things we uh, uh, noticed is that 
a lot of things are very large scale for a residential uh, property. And I think that's in part because uh, Kennedy was doing so much institutional work for, especially for churches. And you can see, of course, that we're under construction in, in different parts of, of the house. We have a 20 year stewardship plan that we're about a year into. So we're continuing to uh, work on it. So we'll just take a little tour around the main rooms on the first floor. Um, the black and white photos are from uh, 1905 when the Hutzlers owned the property. On the right is the uh, what was known as the reception hall, the main uh, entry hall when we uh, purchased the property. Um, on the left here, you can see the wonderful cherry wood that's in the library, um, and which is pretty much all original. It has all the original bookcases and uh, finished trim and so forth. It is missing this uh, wallpaper. It, it appears every room was wallpapered uh, in the house uh, originally. Um, and it's also uh, missing this wonderful chandelier and some bar relief uh, plaster on the ceiling. This is the, the parlor looking towards the uh, reception hall. And you can see there's one big change here. What was a large opening with uh, portier uh, curtains was um, at an early point changed to just a single door. Um, but very nicely done. Uh, the wainscot on the other side is um, almost invisibly uh, uh, pieced in there, but it still retains many of its features, the, the quartz tile fireplace surround, the ceramic uh, uh, hearth and the, the big uh, mirror over the uh, fireplace. Um, it's not the original uh, light fixture, and it is unfortunately missing the cherubs on the ceiling and the, the decorative plasterwork. Uh, the uh, dining room, uh, you can see at one time, if you look on the right side of the black and white photo, had a massive uh, chimney piece of uh, big decorative, uh, uh, tiles and mirrors and a pediment and all sorts of uh, bracketed consoles and, and so forth. We don't know when that disappeared. Um, or why. Or why, uh, exactly. It's a, quite dramatic. We do know that the existing mantle and the pink uh, uh, tiles around it were put in uh, in 1977 uh, by the Watson and McNeil uh, family. So I'm going to, uh, what I love about the house in part is there's just all these wonderful details. On the left is the ceiling of the vestibule, which has just this extraordinary paneling uh, uh, there. And on the right is a column in the reception hall. There's a lot of carvings. The, the carvings on the bottom portion in the photo of the columns are actually some sprouting acorns with oak leaves above them. And then there's a very curvilinear uh, carving uh, above it. Um, you see here we have some basket weave oak lath, which is uh, unique in my experience. I haven't seen that before. They must have uh, bent this with uh, steam bending like they uh, make uh, bent wood chairs. And on the left is uh, some more uh, carvings on the main newel post. I have this theory that being in the uh, wood business that uh, perhaps uh, Mar uh, uh, Martin uh, called up his suppliers and said, hey, would you send me a lot of samples <laughs> of your different carvings and, and install them? Or maybe he just got a good price, I don't know, but um, wonderful stuff. There's also uh, an extensive uh, family of stained and colored glass. On the left is in the stair hall which is mostly uh, colored glass, but also stained uh, glass painted uh, pomegranates and flowers, kind of in a Tiffany style. We don't know who the artisan was. We'd love to find that out. On the upper right, you'll see there's some interior windows which look into the central bathroom. Um, I say look, but uh, it lets uh, light in, but it's entire, they're entirely interior windows. On the bottom are some really playful, lovely little uh, transom windows 
um, that are in a curved uh, corner of the reception hall. So one of the unusual details is this walk-in safe with a big door uh, supplied by the uh, L.H. Miller Safe and Iron Works. Uh, Luke Miller started the company in Baltimore and was one of the premier uh, safe builders on the East Coast. And I particularly like this uh, uh, painting, which kind of looks like a Hudson River School, uh, as if you're standing on a cliff looking down the valley of a river with mist in the, in the, in the background. Um, we have an unusual, another eclectic mix of radiators. On the left is one in the dining room, very geometric. Um, on the right, there's quite a few uh, uh, round uh, radiators, and the one in the library has stone tops. In the center, inside that big box of ductwork, is a stack of radiators that um, air was passed over to provide hot air heating in addition to the radiant heating. So let's just talk about some of the restoration projects that we're, we uh, did. Um, one of the, in fact, the very first thing we did in the basement, the old heating pipes were covered with asbestos and the floor was covered with uh, vinyl asbestos tile. So we had uh, those hazardous materials removed uh, before we ever moved in. Um, there's a lot of damage, uh, plaster work uh, in the building from water damage um, that was uh, uh, made getting a mortgage a little difficult uh, for us, but um, we've been sequentially restoring rooms. This is a room we call the day room on the second floor corner and uh, Hales and Howe have wonderful craftsmen. Um, what they do is they cut a thin slot in the cornice, insert a piece of paper, draw the outline, and then uh, convert that into a metal uh, shape, uh, which is uh, put in what's called a horse. And uh, they run a 10 foot uh, section of it. Um, this craftsman in the shop is called Brain, because I guess he figures everything out. Um, and they, in about 10 minutes, uh, he finishes the shape. And then within a day, it's uh, ready to be installed. And you can see the final product on the lower right. Uh, so um, the electric system is uh, a mess and we're uh, dealing with it. On the left, you can see there's just all sorts of crazy wiring everywhere going to in open boxes and uh, uh, not much meets code. In the center, you can see uh, in the 70s, they installed uh, power for the window air conditioners on the outside of the building. Um, and uh, the conduit is rusted through, there's exposed wire and so forth. We've already gone through CHAP and had that all removed off the outside of the building. On the right, you can see a uh, fuse box. Um, one day, the uh, uh, cleaner was uh, plugged a, a vacuum in the same circuit as an electric heater when we didn't have heat. And uh, the power went out and it took us about an hour to find this box, which is 10 feet high above the door to the elevator um, and has the old fashioned fuses. And those have since been reconnected to a brand new panel. So there's always <laughs> uh, surprises. Um, one of the things that uh, we noticed and were disturbed about is there were these linear cracks in the uh, master bath. Um, and we weren't quite sure why until on the on the right side you can see the plaster repairs uh, were about to start on this curved cornice repair and uh, opened it up and then uh, we discovered on the upper left you'll see that's a single choice where it's smooth on the bottom here. And then this is a ledger board that held boards and about four inches of mortar fill, which supported the marble slab under the toilet and under the penny round tiles. Um, so it's, um, we're fairly certain this was damaged by a leak from the toilet as well as causing this uh, dry rot. 
So this has got to be repaired. And so far we sister the joists underneath to uh, keep it so that when you sit on the toilet, you don't fall through the floor. So um, other plumbing problems, when we first moved in, we were appalled to see that uh, when they did some plumbing work, they put, ran the drain pipe into the parlor and then back out again. Um, so it was, we had to do some extensive new plumbing work. One thing I'll point out is all the pipes go through the middle of the joist rather than the top or the bottom. You can see here's an old notch at the top of a joist, bad thing to do. And, but once we fixed that, we had the plasterers come in and exactly duplicate the plaster. You can see there's little buttons here and some run moldings and, and so forth. Um, uh, this was a fun one for us. It took us a while to figure out what this said above the fireplace in the reception hall. Um, and uh, by cleaning it with uh, dishwashing detergent and a toothbrush, we eventually were able to get the soot off and, and found out this says Ebenezer, which is a, a biblical stone um, where the Israelites won a battle and uh, named the stone nearby Ebenezer. Um, and we assume this uh, had a religious significance uh, for the Hollies. We also uh, have future projects we haven't started on yet. So this wonderful stained glass in the stair hall is missing some pieces, uh, which we'll have to fix. Um, it, this window looking into the bath has a nice observation hole that we <laughs> need to fill in. And uh, these windows, although they're quite attractive, are bowed as uh, the lead kings tend to do over time. And then we have some really ugly kitchens and bathrooms and furnaces in the middle of rooms and so forth that we will be dealing with uh, over the years. Um, the beautiful uh, parquet floors has some water damage in some places and then, you know, kind of baffling holes where someone cut too big a hole for this uh, air conditioning vent. And then uh, the, the crowning jewel of it all will be, this is the existing four by four square columns with chain link fence for a grill here um, and you know, bare, uh, posts sticking up from the top of the roof. So, so we hope to do this wonderful fret work with moons and stars um, and these uh, copier finials in the, um, in the gin. Replacing. Yeah. So one of the things we find, there's always surprises in our house. <laughs> some of them are good and some of them are kind of appalling. But uh, we're going to continue our stewardship and uh, we'll... Uh, keep you abreast of our progress so thanks very much for joining us on this tour and uh, open to questions yeah uh, thank you so much for lisa this is this is really great to hear about the project it's it's really a, a incredible undertaking uh, 20 years you said right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well at first we joked it would be 20 years but from the further we get into it we think that's a, probably a good number <laughs> so i've i've been reading the comments here and we've actually got a, a few people um who are related to the hutzer they're part of the hutzer's family um amy bernstein is here with um with her father who's uh dad's great great grandparents um, were the Hutzlers who owned the home. And um, also on, on the line too is Rosemary Hutzler, um, who has an interesting question, which is, uh, do the Newell posts still open? There's a Hutzler family story about a toy gun that was stored inside one of them. Yes, the yeah. top of the Newell post that I show you uh, lifts off. So I always thought it, would be a great place for a spy to do a little <laughs> hiding uh, in there. Yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> uh, we have another question that's asking, um, is the fan light over the front door original? The, um, the uh, colored glass, as far as I know, it is. Um, it does show up in that uh, very early photo that we yeah. showed you. Yeah. 
One, one interesting thing we discovered through, um, I, I was in communication last year with the Jewish Historical Society, and they put me in touch with some of the Hutzler de descendants, and they shared some of the, those earlier photographs, and we discovered through one of them that the house had speaking tubes. So we know where one is, but we don't know where the others are, and we'd love to um, unearth those over time if we can, maybe get a metal detector or something, but... <laughs> Interesting. Um, uh, Michelle here, Michelle Johnson here, says that she's tuning in from Boston. She's originally from Baltimore and says that her grandmother was a cook for the Hutzlers. Oh. And she grew up hearing stories about about the family. Oh, great! Wow. Wow. I'll have I'll have to share um, share the 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 chat the chat log with you. Yeah. This. There's lots of some really great comments coming in, but to get to some more, some more questions here, um, uh, Charles here is asking, how did you ID the exterior stone as being from um, from where it was? Is is this perhaps the only place to find pink granite? Uh, well, so there is, uh, we uh, again, uh, I think mostly uh, Lisa's research, but um, we do like visiting Maine and there is, um, actually a, a peninsula connected with a causeway, but it has a very famous uh, quarry there that uh, uh, manufactures yeah. the uh, pink granite and they yeah. have a museum. Yeah, it's a uh, Deer Island on the Blue Hill Peninsula in mid coast. And um, I came upon that reference of the granite in, the, in an article in 1888. And uh, another question, um, how can the apartment areas be restored um, and are the original floors and walls still there? So um, I, I think uh, kudos to Richard Watson who did uh, a good job of, of dividing the apartment. So much of the original woodwork is uh, still in, in the apartments um, uh, and um, and did, most of the segmentation occurred in the servants' hall, so they were um, cut off, and and so areas remain intact. Um, the servants' stair is a grand stair would be in Bolton Hill, a regular townhouse. It's uh, um, a regular width, and it's oak, and it, it's quite lovely. And um, the there are. In the, in the house, I think there's 12 fireplaces. I get confused sometimes, but the fireplaces and the mantles and so forth are, have been retained. And yeah. so not all in good condition, <laughs> but, um, but we're working through that, so. Okay, and, uh, and Amy, um, who's a descendant of the Hutzlers, are saying that uh, her dad talked about the glass bubbles on the front door and she was wondering if, if those still exist. Well, that um, picture we ended with uh, is coming from the glass bubbles. That's a, those bubbles are um, colored prisms that are embedded in the second set of doors between the front door, the vestibule, and then the second set of doors. So those, those colors are from, from the prisms of the light coming through. Yeah, I don't know if, if we can go back to that picture then. Uh, um, yeah. So, so the answer is yes. Uh, so I'll, I'll do a couple more questions here uh, before we wrap up. Um, can you tell if the beautiful ceilings were painted over and is there any chance of restoring them? Okay, so all of the original plaster, all of the ceilings have been replaced. And we, we worked on hundreds of historic properties and Plaster lasts 50 years, sometimes 100 years, but it's you know well past that here. So at some earlier time, um, all of the, the plaster was gone, but can it be restored? We, we've already talked to uh, Hales and Howe, who are expert plasters, and they said, yes, based on the photos, we can restore it. And it's always, I was wondering if, uh, if you two are currently living in the house. Absolutely. Yeah, we call it, <laughs> I call it glampy. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so uh, a certain amount of annoyance from dust and, yeah. and workmen uh, coming there, but luckily it's big enough so that we can kind of segment off air areas and 
uh, have the work done there. So right now we're, we're living there. Uh, the plasters are going to show up next week to do another section uh, um, yeah. of the, the what we call the elevator hall. And uh, um, the plumber is going to uh, tomorrow, I think, put in the uh, uh, faucet in the vanity and so forth. But uh, we're living there and continuing the restoration. Yeah. It's an, it's an adventure. So you, you said that, did you say it was around 8,000 square feet in total? <laughs> yeah. And, and that was, you know, we live in one of the four units and that's plenty big for us. Yeah. Right. But, okay. Last, last question for you, for you here is um, someone was, was wondering, um, Patricia Willis said, I went to many social events at the house from 1988 to 1994. Our sons went to Hopkins together. Um, are you planning on offering tours of the house at any point? Oh, gosh. Well, we already have been offering tours of the house. So, <laughs> um, but uh, many people have come through and, uh, but we don't have a, any official schedule or, or yeah, spring, maybe, but Maybe if there's some charitable, you know, house tour in Bolton Hill, we'd be willing to be a part of that. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you both for for attending. This was this was a really great presentation, and really happy to see that uh, this house has found two people who who love it and are going to take great care of it and bring it back to its former yeah. yeah. glory, or at least you know, like how make it a, a nice home once again. Right. Um, yeah. and, and Nathan, if people have questions, if they'd like to be in touch with us, you can you know forward that to us. Great, yeah, and I'll, I'll I'll share you I'll share with you the, the chat log here, oh, um, and then also uh, just to let everyone know this program was being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. So if you just search for the Baltimore Architecture Foundation on YouTube, you can find the recording for this. It should be up by Monday, um, and then recordings of all of our previous virtual histories. So thank you so much for joining us, and uh, have a great weekend. Great to talk Bye. to you. Have a good journey.